Hey everyone, welcome to Art Chat. My name is Justin Donaldson, and today uh, we have Nathan Fox with us. Nathan, how are you doing? I am doing fantastic, Justin. How are you? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. I'm really excited to get to, to chat to you, so thanks for joining. I appreciate that. Yeah, so I've been talking to a bunch of landscape artists, kind of just uh, sharing together our love for, for landscape painting, and I know you do a lot of a lot of landscape and environment work. Can you tell me just a little bit about your your practice or your relationship with landscape and environment work? Yeah, it's uh, it, it's a major relationship. Uh, <laughs> enough so, I think maybe it makes my wife jealous uh, <laughs> uh, once in a while. I get that. Uh, maybe I can tell you this, Justin, because when I started my my art career, uh, I'm in animation. Uh, my yes. my real job is working as an animation artist uh, and I love landscape painting so we'll uh, we'll call that my art hobby though I, I try and raise my game to a professional level with it but my first uh, job in animation I got hired at DreamWorks to work on the Prince of Egypt yes. it was an amazing opportunity well guess what the very first thing that we did uh, for that show was one week after I started, they piled this all uh, on a tour bus. We did not go to Egypt. Oh, okay. I, I wondering... wish. Yeah. Uh, they actually uh, were here in Los Angeles. And uh, here in California, we have Death Valley. Yes. Uh, brutally hot place. But if you go in October, it's beautiful. And it happened to be October. Oh, good. So they took us out to Death Valley where there's as close to an Egyptian environment. Uh, as uh, is available. And we spent an entire week out there painting landscapes as kind of a warm up for the show. And it, it was amazing. That sounds And amazing. so, yeah, yeah, thank you. And so landscape has always had a primary relationship to my professional work. So luckily the thing I love to do personally and the thing I love to do professionally, uh, they, they come together. That's, is there is there any uh, difference when you're working professionally versus for yourself? How how's that dynamic? Yeah, well, you know, you uh, uh, you have to follow somebody else's brief. Yes, uh, of course, when you're when you're working professionally. But what happens in real life landscape painting really comes into play uh, for your professional work because when you're doing personal landscape painting for me, but I think this is true for most artists, you're, you're painting for a specific reason, which is you're going along looking around to, to make a painting. You said, that's the spots. There's yeah. something about it. And so uh, for me, I've got to identify what is the reason I stopped here to paint and zero in on that. And Justin, maybe you can identify with me on this. It is so easy to get caught up in all the other little things, you know, oh, if you don't force, you gotta, you, you know, you gotta move heaven and earth to focus in on that. What's that one aspect that made you want to stop and paint it? And uh, if you do that, you might actually have a piece of art on your hands. If you just start rendering mindlessly details, it's not going to happen, in my opinion. And what's the it work? Sorry. Oh, I was going to say, Go what, what, what's that process for you, um, identifying why you stopped? Is it an intuitive process or um, an intellectual process, or are you, have you gotten better at it over time? Yeah, I've, I've had to, uh, after making every mistake in the book, I've had <laughs> to uh, yeah, force myself to get to it. So I actually kind of, I can't usually say it out loud. I actually mumble to myself. So, okay. you know, I look like a crazy person. If, if you're nearby, don't worry. Uh, you know, the between the mumbling and the eye patch, people, <laughs> if people are nearby, they start moving away. By the way, if anyone's wondering, uh, yeah, the, the eye patch, uh, uh, I'll go ahead and say it's for fun, but it's not. I went through a procedure. It happens. No worries. The eye is going to be fine. So okay. uh, I got an eye patch on. But yeah, I've got to just kind of say it out loud to myself. Here's what I think really is why I wanted to paint this place. Kind of just look at what it is visually and then make sure I paint that. And I don't allow, even if there's something really there uh, in the scene that distracts from it, I feel like I've got to leave that other thing out that might take away from that primary sense of purpose. And it's the same professionally. 
the boss tells you or the story tells you really, here's what's happening in this moment, here's the emotion. If you don't zero in on that, uh, you know, um, they're gonna find you buried in Death Valley the next week because uh, you, you know, uh, you didn't fulfill the brief. Yes, here, let me, let me bring up some of your work here for a minute. Sure, sure. Um, so when, when you're out there, you're in the field, um, what kind of problems do you like to tackle? Like, is there a pattern in, in, obviously you tell yourself why you've stopped here and why you're painting. Have you found a pattern a long time as to the kinds of things that really intrigue and fascinate you? Yeah. And it's, it's the same, it's the same idea from getting down to the guts of the landscape. So for me, the, the central problem to solve is finding the simple statement. And that doesn't mean I'm against detail, yeah. though usually for me, you know, we're out here in the California sun. For me, though, I, I, I try and travel uh, when I'm able. Uh, but often I have like one hour before the light changes significantly. Yes. And so you've got to find the simple statement. And so for me, that is the primary challenge. How do I take literally, I, I don't think it's an exaggeration, Justin. Uh, I, th I think you're with me on this. I've, I've seen your work and seen the challenges that, that you solve. Uh, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that you can see a hundred million details yes. looking around a landscape. How do you, how do you uh, funnel that down into an hour? That's the primary problem. That is, that's it. Which is, which is, which is, uh, intriguing it's fast I, I love that i love that and i i find that i'm a a much wiser painter whenever i'm doing that uh which kind of leads me to the next question of of okay so we have these time periods that are that are really short and they allow us to sort of abbreviate everything does your approach and your relationship change when you're working on on a bigger painting on a more finished a uh, larger piece or, or do you kind of have the same approach? I would say it's the same. Uh, it is bigger, but what I try and do to compensate is use bigger brushes. Right, yes. Uh, yeah, this is good news for me because I, I realize something when I, uh, the times when I paint it in my home studio and I'm doing, you know, smaller sketches, I realize that my bigger paintings if I use bigger brushes, actually don't end up taking a whole lot longer yes. than my careful studies. So, uh, uh, so I like that direct, spontaneous approach, the economy uh, of painting. And uh, I'm a little bit impatient, uh, maybe a lot impatient, but I also feel like that when you have, uh, when you give yourself a, a deadline or a time, timeline, you have a little bit more spontaneity. It means you might utterly fail, but when they turn out, there's a shot that there's a real life in those paintings. And so, yeah, that's my at-home challenge. Yeah. Do, do you, how much time do you spend sitting down between when you've decided what you're going to paint and, and when you paint? Like, do you have a time where you're mentally planning things out or processing things? Or do you process during the, you know, the paint action happening? That is a great question. Usually at home, I'm working from photos I shot on location and sketches that I did there. And so I have reference right in front of me that I can think through. I really do. I, I rehearse it in my head. Like I walk myself through, I'm going to, here's, here's where I want to go with it. And then I think if I do this, 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 and this, and build up in this way, that has a good chance of giving me the best chance of giving me the results that I want. So if I rehearse it in my head, I have a better chance of getting that momentum and that flow going that lets me get a more spontaneous, uh, fresh looking painting. So more planning equals more spontaneity. Uh, I like the way you put that. Can I steal that line from you? You absolutely can. <laughs> okay, great. That's um, so in, in a, in a very practical sense, so that sort of me and other people who are watching this can like picture it, what kind of time period is that? Are we talking about like five minutes or, or 10 minutes or as much time as the painting takes? Like, 
I know it's going to be different every time, but. Uh, maybe, maybe in the range of five, seven, ten minutes yeah. max. Yeah. And all even, you know, I, I'm all in favor of using every tool that's available to you. Sometimes if I have some photo reference, I'll, uh, you know, I'm a digital artist professionally. Everything is right. done digital these days, of course. Uh, but I'll take my photo, uh, I'll take it, my photo reference or my sketches, I'll take them into Photoshop and put a few strokes just to say to myself, you know, I think the sky really, I remember it being deeper. I think it'll look better deeper. Let me put that stroke down and see how that looks. Uh, so I, I have a tool that, that lets me actually be more direct in the painting. And it's not an, I, I don't always do that, but I'm in favor of doing anything that's gonna give you the painting, that's going to create that mood and that emotion of the experience that you had out on the location. Yeah. So I, I see in your work just a, a very um, high sensibility of color. Um, how do you make something feel colorful? Uh, blood, sweat, and tears, my <laughs> friend. Yeah, every color, color is so hard, it, it shouldn't be. Because, you know, I'm always talking in, in my classes, uh, our eyesight is made out of three properties. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah the, the value, you know, the lights and the darks, the color hue, meaning red, yellow, blue, whatever it is, and then the level of saturation. That's it. That's everything we see are those three things. And yet those three things combined create, I, I read that the human eye can distinguish, it was actually a scientific study, 2.3 million color variations wow. can come out of those three properties. Yeah. So no wonder it's staggering, right? Yes. Uh, so practice, practice, practice with color. Uh, I've been, I've been all about trying to understand color for the last uh, 25 years. And really it's in the form of sketch after sketch, after sketch, after sketch, uh, every day, you know, until the sun goes out to really get a feel for how to manage that complexity. Yes, I, I'm just looking at the, the comparison between these two paintings, mm -hmm. um, and they both feel colorful. This one because the color is surrounded by by gray. This one because oh, this next one because uh, everything in it is colorful. Sorry, I just missed it there. Yeah. Um, how do you how do you decide when where you're going to put a, a high level of color? Of, Saturation, perhaps, is the right word for what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's that's another learn the lesson the hard way. Uh, <laughs> Justin, have you ever seen, I'm, I'm sure you and, and everybody out there watching this has had the experience. Maybe you're at an art fair, maybe a local art fair, and there might be, you know, you going uh, from booth to booth, and maybe there's someone who does beautiful local wa watercolors, and, and you love it, but then you go to the next booth, and you have someone whose paintings have the feeling that, hey, painting means life and life means bright, saturated colors. And if bright, right. saturated colors are good, more of them are even better. <laughs> and you've, you've had that. You've seen that, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you have, the, you, you have to turn away. I mean, it's so loud and garish. I always joke with people, you know, you have to turn away as if it's going to trigger diabetes <laughs> some kind of high blood sugar response uh, just by looking at this sugary saturation. And to me, I, I learned the hard way that that is the amateur approach. Right. You want blue. And so you reach for, hey, I want blue. So I reach and I mix a blue and I put down a blue. That's not how it works. If you have a warm, uh, if you have a warm passage in your painting and you do so much as put a neutral gray that has zero blue in it, it's going to look richly blue just by being on that warm. Yeah. And so the pro knows, okay, I got to mix not a blue, a gray, because in that context, the gray is going to have the rich cool that I want it to have. And then you have rich, you know, gray purples, gray greens, gray, you know, browns, and they all just richly come to life. And then, uh, you may want some primary points of interest where you do have the more saturated colors. And so all of a sudden your saturation is very special. And instead of people being turned away in horror from the garish <laughs> loud painting, 
they're drawn in and, and want to see more. That's my personal hope and goal for the paintings. I love it. So always trying to draw people in to want want more of it. Um, and I see in some of these that normally that normally means that you have sort of one passage of of light that really is kind of striking the color or the you know the orange in this one coming in through. Mm -hmm. um, surrounded by less less intense colors. So what is what did what kind of um landscapes do you do you like to do or what do you look for when you're looking for um a land, when you're going out do you go out to places that you know will have beautiful things or do you just try and um what's your practice i i've had uh i've had a very uh lucky and amazing opportunity uh to go to pace, places that almost guarantee that there's yes. a, a subject uh, in animation, my timing has been really good and really lucky in animation. I went through art school in the early 90s, and then the animation boom started after that. And my generation of artists had a chance to, to come into that and, and be yes. part of it and contribute to it. So now, and for the last several years, uh, animation and video game design studios have been popping up in every city everywhere in the world. But they don't have the history of animation that we have here in Los Angeles. Right. So they don't necessarily have a wealth of local talent for that reason. It just wasn't a thing until it was so huge in the 90s, the 2000s, and, and a lot of studios popped up or got into the game. And so they started inviting people like me to come out for to do some workshops, come out for a week or two, do consulting and work with their studio to uh, contribute, you know, because I've been in, I started in 2004 professionally. Yes. So uh, I've, I've had enough time to make every mistake, you know, and know what not to do. And also uh, uh, my, my primary here in LA, you know, we have DreamWorks, we have Disney, we have Paramount Animation and others. And I have had the chance to work for all of those studios. And so they kind of like that. Hey, you know, we're bringing in DreamWorks artists, Disney artists to, to right. share ideas. And so I go on these trips. But of course, I schedule additional time to go yes. sightseeing. You don't want to go to Berlin, you know, and, and not uh, spend some extra time. And so I take my sketchbook. I take my sketch kit. I take my watercolors and roam around the town for a few days or a week as much time as I can get off. And that's what a lot of my paintings have become about uh, during the last decade. It's been an amazing opportunity. So those are my subjects. It's yeah, been, I love that. Oh, wow. Um, where, can we, where can we find, I know you're pulling out a, a landscape painting book. You've published one. Yeah. Uh, where, yeah. Can I, where can I find that here on your website? And can you tell us just a little bit about that before we get to, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah, it's just come out uh, recently. Uh, so uh, people should go to uh, designstudiopress.com. That's the publisher. Now, it's available on Amazon. Just go to Amazon. Uh, you can get it. And uh, uh, so it's very easy to get and have shipped. Uh, I recommend Design Studio Press because that cuts out the middleman. Right. Uh, the the uh, publisher gets a better cut rather than them sending it to Amazon. So uh, please go to Design Studio Press, but if for any reason that doesn't work for anyone, it's there for you on Amazon. It's called How to Paint Landscapes. Uh, uh, the, the publisher added uh, the line into it quickly and beautifully. So <laughs> how to paint landscapes quickly and beautifully in watercolor and gouache. What, what prompted you to write this book? I, mean, I have a good guess, but. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I put together uh, I put together a landscape painting course that I've been teaching for the last many years, and so I had that uh, I had that material worked yeah. out in class form, and that takes you one step closer to putting that information and images together in book form. And as I had been doing out uh, these paintings I've been mentioning, yeah, as I'd been out painting those. I also would photograph my process for my classes 
Well, I have that then in step-by-step -step form and I can just turn that into a book. And so that's something that I really wanted to get together. And, uh, and so we, we got it done last year and, uh, and it's out. I love it. Well, I hope some people can uh, go and find it and buy it. Uh, we do have a couple of questions in the chat. So here, Jared says, uh, Mr. Forks, if you have the time, oh, sorry, let's pull you back in. There you go. Uh, correlated. What would your advice be for someone who tends to paint more dull and wants to explore more color? Likewise, easy. if you're too colorful, how does one balance? Yeah, uh, easy in principle, extremely difficult in practice. <laughs> so it's this simple. If your painting is kind of dull, you know, you end up gray on gray on gray, brown on brown on brown, then look for... Uh, you know, we, we often call them a compliment. If you look at the color wheel, let's say your print painting is just, it's all gone brown and boring. Then if you think of what is visually opposite or has contrast to brown, well, a cool does. You, know, you can think about the color wheel and blue being on the opposite in terms of contrast from orange and brown and so forth. Just find something that stands in opposition. Uh, you, any landscape, you'll find something that feels cool somewhere in it. Grab that. Give it a nice, rich, uh, cool blue, and it will just sing against those browns. Likewise, you do an image that's too saturated, then just uh, find one or two things to push back on. Maybe you have uh, lots of yellow greens, and you have lots of oranges, and you have some reds and magentas popping out. Maybe the red and the magenta is too much. Can you let go of the magenta, pull the red out, and then maybe your foliage, whatever's creating the greens, nice rich gray greens in there, some red accents. Like you see the image that's up. Are yeah. they seeing that flower yeah, yeah. image on screen? They're yeah, there you that. go. Thank you for bringing that up. You're welcome. That image is mostly gray right there. Right. More than anything else, it has gray but it has browns and it has gray greens and I've popped out the yellow green and I've popped out the red. And so uh, let go of what's too much and pull out what's not enough. And it's just kind of that balancing unifying elements with contrasting elements. That's the trick. Too yeah. much contrast, yuck. Too little contrast, boring. Find that balance. Yeah. So how much how much do you push and pull what you're seeing when you're there? Uh, maybe plein air painting when you're there at the time and you're um, painting something. How much do you decide that you can push or pull, or what are the elements that you push and pull? Like, do you play around? Light sheet and still, baby. Okay. Just lie. Tell 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 as many lies as you want. Okay. Uh, you're the artist, but I often like to tell, because my, my students, that's, that's an important question. I, yeah. I appreciate uh, It's a really good question. And I like to tell uh, my landscape painting students, uh, it's okay and even necessary to tell a series of little white lies to get at the greater truth. Yes. You go to a landscape, you feel something about it, uh, there's something about it that's special or emotional. You do whatever it takes to communicate that emotion to the audience. Mm -hmm. To not do that, I mean, your digital camera can better and faster than you can make it look how it really looks. Forget about how it really looks on some level. Pull out and tell a series of little white lies. If it has this amazing uh, uh, contrast, but uh, you need to create more contrast in the actual painting for the painting to have that impact. Yes. You know, your flat 2D painting versus the real world that includes a big three-dimensional space and smells and wind. None of that exists in the painting. It's okay to grab and exaggerate elements uh, in the landscape to compensate for what you can't put into it. Absolutely. So, yeah, I, I push those things as hard as I can. As hard as you can before it breaks? Maybe a little bit more? Uh, so say again? I said as, as hard as you can before it breaks. Yes, find <laughs> that line and then pull back from it. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay, and then we have one last question here. It says, love the interview so far. I'm aspiring to be an illustrator one day. What was the hardest, what was hardest for you in your process of learning? Sometimes I feel like I get stuck and I don't know how to proceed. 
Excellent question, uh, because all of us want to up our game, and yet this is so very, very difficult. So I, I sympathize a great deal with the question. I remember, and, and still have at times, of course, uh, extraordinary frustration at things just not coming together and not know how to, how to make them come together. Yeah. So the thing that I struck on to that worked for me personally, and I do recommend it because I think it, it works for just about anyone is an obvious thing, but I did little quick sketches. I mean, like not just by the hundreds, but by the thousands. Right. Because every time I do a little painting, just a little, you know, one hour, uh, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, one hour, you solve a problem every time you do that. And if you do one a day, three a day, five a day, how good are you going to be after a year? So for me, it was uh, master sketches, just doing copies of the images I admire, sketching and painting from life. And then also because the question was illustrator oriented, you know, professional, imaginative work, uh, doing sketches from imagination to make sure that uh, those ideas that I'm learning from life and study, I'm able to bring them back out with my own ideas. Yes. And I've done that for the last 25 years. There isn't a day that goes by where I don't make sure I do my little personal study or more. Yeah. And I can credit any success I've had with doing that. And I do have one addition to add to that. One thing I did not understand if I can veer away from landscape painting, this is actually okay, where yeah, landscape fine. painting uh, worked against me, Justin, okay. was um, I didn't realize how important character and people. I love painting people. I, I teach a portrait painting class. Yeah. But I didn't realize professionally how much people want and need to see character and people and expression and character pose when you're doing an illustration and you're creating a mood or telling a story because I'm such a landscape guy. <laughs> and they would always say like the director, the animator, I would do a sketch. And the purpose of the sketch was literally to show the landscape. It wasn't about anything else. Right. And the director would always say, the director would say, Oh, I like it, but it's missing something. I mean, make it warmer and I'd make it warmer and they wouldn't be satisfied. <laughs> it was when I started painting characters, into those scenes that they felt like it had the finishing emotion that it needed. Gotcha. That's interesting. So, yeah. So those two things have, you know, kind of coming from one end and then coming back from the other end yeah. have got my career uh, to click together finally after all the pain and suffering. Wow. Yeah. I, I can definitely uh, advocate for doing lots of small work. I feel like there's a, you're practicing, a beginning and you're practicing an end and you just get that that um, ability to decide your composition and practice on on both ends of things you know 10 times where maybe if you're doing a finished piece you get to practice it once um, that is very well said yeah there's i i have found a wealth of of valuable uh, understanding through that as well um yeah so thank you so we are wrapping up. We're coming to a close. Is there anything else that you've been uh, thinking about or any particular art problems you've been trying to get your head around and solve lately? I'll give everyone a challenge, if yeah. you don't mind. Go for it. This is an absolutely horrible challenge. Wonderful. Don't do it. The but, best. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I'm going to call it the three value challenge. Uh, people Sometimes people like to think about four values and such. Uh, do a light and dark painting, just value only, you know, no color. Yes. With only three values. Any three values doesn't have to be white, black, and middle. And here's the challenge of that. The light value is going to be, uh, you know, that, that's not hard to figure out. That's your lights. The dark value yeah. is easy to figure out. But what is that middle value? Is it light? Is it dark? Right. How do you need to shape it to make your landscape or whatever you're painting? How do the shapes need to work out for it to make sense? That is incredibly hard. Uh, I recommend only doing that as an exercise. Don't do your landscape paintings like that 
it sure. can be disastrous. <laughs> but having to make that choice rather than mindlessly copying what you're seeing, right? It it just so stretches your artistic muscles. Right. Give so that a shot. Practicing the, the the discernment. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I've uh, really enjoyed getting to chat with you. And it's been absolutely my pleasure. Good luck, everybody, and thank you much, Justin. Thank you. We'll see you guys later.